The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Net Wealth Investments Limited, ABN 85090 569 109, AFSL 230 975, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Advice tech. As if it wasn't enough to be across TMD's Alpha Beta, Rule of 72 and all the other nuances of financial advice. Now, advisors are expected to be across all the technology options too, and there's so many of them. But never fear, Peter D is here. Join me each week on a journey of discovery through the software and apps on offer for advisors and advice businesses. So let's dive in, fellow advice explorers. Discover a world of advice. Join Matt Heiner, CEO of Net Wealth, as he chats to industry professionals and thought leaders on the latest technologies, business models, changing demographic patterns, and general trends impacting wealth management. Listen at netwealth.com.au forward slash between meetings. This ad is presented by Net Wealth Investments Limited and does not consider individual circumstances. Seek professional advice and read the relevant PDS to determine if Net Wealth is appropriate for you. Past performance is not a reliable indicator of future performance. Hello and welcome to the Ensemble Advice Tech Podcast. I'm Peter Diamantidis and joining me here today is the incoming host of the podcast. He started as a customer service specialist, which I love. Um, That's where all the hard work gets done. Then he worked his way up to becoming a financial advisor. He's now the head of technology that seems relevant, for Collins SBA in Tasmania, but is in fact joining us here from Rome, Italy. Thank you so much for joining me here today, Patrick Carter. Woo! Welcome. Peter, thank you. Yeah. And welcome to your grand finale. How are you feeling? Oh, it's a bit weird. It's a bit, it's strange, you know? It's, I'm just so used to talking to the screen and, and that sort of thing that's a bit odd. In fact, before we kick off, and I didn't yep. warn you I was going to do this, but before we kick oh. off, I've got to share something that just happened two days ago to me. Mm-hmm. I was going to the Opera House to see some theatre, parked in that crazy whirly car park underneath the Opera House, uh-huh. and you're all a bit close together, and the car next to me, the guy had just arrived to leave, right? So he just got into his car to leave. His window was down. And I get out and he takes a look at my Mustang Max and said, wow, you're driving my midlife crisis car. And I laughed, you know, and I said, oh, it's my midlife crisis car too, right? And in hearing my voice, he jerked his head and looked straight at me. He went, you're Peter from the Advice Tech Podcast. (laughs) Like, I am, he said. And he held up his phone and he was just plugging it into the car to listen to an episode of the podcast. Can you believe that? You're joking. No. That is incredible. Unbelievable. So that was my little two and a half seconds of fame right there, folks. Um, and I didn't grab your name, sir. So please reach out, whoever I bumped into at the Sydney Opera House car park. It was an absolute joy and gave me a really good giggle. So, Patrick, you have that in your future. Oh, you I, yourself. I, I cannot wait. And obviously you do too still because the episodes won't disappear. There will still be 70 plus um, moments <sighs> of gold. I know. On all uh, popular podcasting platforms. Yes, exactly. I mean, yes, folks, so um, you may not realize it, even though you've been uh, allowing me to pop into earbuds every week, but we are at episode 72, I think. So we've been together quite some time. Uh, so <laughs> thank you for allowing me to do that. Now, when we decided that we were going to do a handover episode. Um, We figured that it makes sense, right? I mean, anytime there's a new, somebody takes on a new role, you hand over things. So we thought, well, we've got to do that for this. We've got to give the listener the opportunity to to hear from us both together. And I love that you cheekily decided, well, that'd be a great opportunity for you to grill me on how you use the technology, right? On it, actually specifically the apps I use, which I love. Yeah. Which would be so. In fact, we're going to get to that. We're also going to get to um, brainstorming between us if we could start with a blank slate, what tech we might or how we might approach that, which is an interesting concept. And for any of you that are early on in your tech stack journey, I reckon that could be pretty cool because for some of us, and I'm sure. Um, Patrick, you guys at Collins and, and for us, we've had this, you know, we've got legacy systems we've got to deal with or legacy approaches. Whereas if any of you are a bit early on, I mean, part of me gets a bit excited about the thought of 
wiping it all clean and starting again, I've got to say. I don't know about you, Patrick. Would that be a bit exciting if you could just I mean, start clean again? I'm thinking about this on a daily basis. I would yeah. just, I'm just so envious of probably every startup out there right. or maybe even every non-financial services business where everything actually integrates. I think, yeah, it's, it's a dream of mine personally. Right. And look, and I think – it doesn't even have to be um, you're starting from scratch for that reason. It could be because maybe you're moving dealer group or something. Like yeah. those those moments are an opportunity to go right then. What Breaking should we free do? From and how- the shackles of mandated technology. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So before we dive in though, right, we'll dive into the serious stuff in a second. I figure we've got to cover the daggy questions I always start the podcast with to get use, you know, to get to learn your personal use of technology and, hey, mine too. So – Let's kick it off with the question I know the listener is waiting for. What's your most used emoji? Do you use emojis? Of course. A uh, millennial, so definitely a quick little reach away from the keyboard. It's got to be, for me, the smiley face, but with a single tear rolling down the cheek because oh. it just works in every single uh, scenario. So you might have a yeah. team member leaving, they might be unwell, or they might have achieve something and you're actually crying but with happiness. So it's just a very versatile one. No. Nice. How about yourself, Peter? Has anyone even asked you that ever before? No. So so look, I've got two when I took a look, I've got two that are absolutely my most used. Um one is the smiley face with star eyes. Oh yeah. yeah. And what's hysterical is actually in my head when I click on that, what I'm actually like in my head the sound is ta da like I've got a <laughs> Whole, right. Like this whole experience with that emoji for me. Like so yeah. it's, it's got its own energy. And yeah. the other one I use loads, which is probably my default one, is the nerd. So it's the smiley with the glasses. Yeah, and the teeth and, sort of peeking out there too. Yep. Yeah, because I think for me – what, do you know what I love emojis for? And we're actually using them lots more in client com- communications. We now use emojis mm-hmm. and GIFs a lot more than I thought we ever would. Yep. Because it just – sets the tone. It's like the soundtrack for the words you use, you know, and yeah. it can just take the edge off. And so the the geeky one I find, if I'm saying something that's a bit, even on LinkedIn, you know, I'm commenting on something and it's a bit formal, I'll just add that and it just yeah. sort of takes the edge off a little. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so There's a tiny little bit of context just if they're unsure reading it in a certain way. I love it. Exactly right. All righty. Now, second up, smartphones, dang them. We've always got them. We can't live without them. Some of them have them on our wrists. Um, If you had to delete everything off your smartphone and just keep three apps, what three would you keep? Well, Peter, I was going to say Macquarie, but then I'd also need to keep Macquarie Authenticator. So that's two. So, you know, the first time I've needed an app for my app. So (laughs) we'll skip that one. Um, Pretty boring. So Spotify, or actually not anymore because your era is over. Uh, Mm. WhatsApp for family and friends, and I'm t- I'm sort of tied between Google Maps or Google Translate, so currently in another country, but um, I think we'll go with Google Maps. Good point. In fact, Google Translate, my husband and I were just discussing that. We're planning a trip to uh, South America later in the year for our 20th wedding anniversary, mm-hmm. and we bo- both talked about how powerful Google Translate can be in the moment, you know, and it's not, I'm a big fan of trying to just wing it when you're in places and, and make the effort, but it's when yeah. it's that complicated thing you're trying to do. Yeah. Like, mm, I think Body I need language only words. gets you so far and waving um, your hands around. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And speaking Completely. English when they don't speak English. Yeah. Completely. Now, I'm right there with you with Google Maps. Google Maps is, so it's not just um, the tool I use to get from A to B, uh, 100% it's that, but actually I use it to collect places I've loved or want to go to. Yeah. And yep. so I can I could now log in and if somebody said, Oh Peter, you know, that um restaurant you said was really great on the Faroe Islands. <laughs> We're heading there, you know, in a month. What what's its name? And I can just <laughs> zoom into that area and I've tagged it. <laughs> oh, its name's this. So so I um collect all those places for all over the world. Uh, and Sydney, you know, I've got all sorts of places tagged. Uh, so it's my little sort of adventure map as well as just normal Perfect. map. Um, and I assume you've done that obviously for your upcoming trip as well. So you've yes, 70, 80% of the hard work's already done. Yes. And in fact, um, so Nick and I love, my husband and I, sorry, I love watching uh, things like everybody uh, loves, well, somebody feed Phil, you know, yep. and all these yep. sort of food shows. Uh, and so, you know, w- as we're watching them, I'm sort of like actively watching them as in, oh, that looks yummy, tag. <laughs> 
<laughs> that place in the deep south, south of America with barbecue tag, you know, so they're yeah. all going to Google Maps. Um, so anywhere that I travel, there's invariably somewhere I've already heard about um, that we're going to visit, which is lots of fun. Now, what are my others? So, for, so Google Maps definitely look. We, I love movies and cinema, so IMDb, um, which for those of you who don't know is the Internet Movie Database app, yep. which is that question where, where, what other movie was that person on? You know, like that sort of yeah. stuff that my husband and yeah. I have as debates. So that would probably would be the other one. And finally, probably Slack. Our business mm-hmm. completely runs on Slack. So when I travel, that is the one app, even if I've said I'm out of action, that's the one app I probably would keep on anyway. So Keeps you connected, yep. Yeah, exactly. And and in a really easy, don't need to troll through everything way, uh, which we probably might get through to later, actually. Now, <clears throat> the next two questions I normally ask our guests when they come back for the second time, right? But I actually think I'm really curious about your answer to this next one. Mm-hmm. If someone came to you and offered to build an AI buddy just for you, right? So it was just the AI designed specifically for a task that it does magically for you. What would you get it to do, or what would you love it to mean that you never have to do again? I mean, this is this is a very lazy answer, but I am learning Italian. But probably just be able to communicate with someone fluently right. but in whatever language they speak. As I said, so currently the universal learning the language. translator concept, you know, exactly. But I just yeah. currently sort of sit there like a two-year-old and sort of smile and nod and just sort of say ciao, ciao, grazie at the end, and that's it. So yeah. I think that would level me up entirely and and sort of remove that. Um, intense learning curve that sort of, uh, I was going to say older Australians or people that are probably not children anymore have when they learn a, another language that's not English. Oh, definitely. And it's yeah. um, it's actually quite isolating. I think people who particularly, so I don't know about you, but I don't I don't speak a second language at all, right? So there isn't any of those that I've, I've managed to do. And major maths brain, right? So I think that actually repels new languages. I think that yeah. <laughs> logic okay. yeah. logic doesn't help you learn a language, right? Yeah. It's just yeah. not how it works. So um, I've always struggled uh, and I'm with you. It's to not be able to sort of feel included can be a struggle in a foreign I'm country. With you. And just in my mind, the way I need to sort of shake off from the learning is there is not always the English equivalent of that word or that yes. sentence structure. Like in your yeah. mind, you're having the English version on, on top of it or below it, yeah. but it's just not how it works. I'm, I'm totally with you. But yeah. uh, I would love to know if someone offered you, offered you the same, what would you what mm. would you feel? Well, mine probably is, is in the category of my other favourite thing. So one of my favourite things is cinema, definitely. Okay. But my other favourite thing is food. I'm a bit of a foodie and we love cooking. And so I would love some AI that would let you scan in all the recipe books you have and all the maybe downloaded recipes from the from the web. And then I could say to it, well, we've got some broccolini that's about to turn. What, what are some recipes? You know, And even if it just gave you the list and then I went off to the book and looked at page 32, just to not have to flick through Every mm. book to find what we're looking for. Apple Vision Pro on your head or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So that I would love that. Um, I don't need it to troll everything because the you know as in all the all the, all the world of recipes, I do that sometimes, but it's a bit overwhelming. But I'd love yeah. it to sort of point me to the right direction for the things we've got to cook, and that would nice. be yeah because I've got I've got a pet peeve about food waste, so I I'd love that to help mm-hmm. us keep on top of yeah keep on top of what what food we so we don't throw as, quite as much out. Now, the last one, which is a bit funny to talk about because here we are two tech geeks we in an advice tech podcast. Yeah. But you know what? Not all technology is good technology. Sometimes the digital version makes things worse. So I'm curious, is there anything in your life where you prefer the sort of more analog or older tech version? Is there anything? I, I think if you if you ask me Recently, I probably wouldn't have an answer, but I have recently bought like a secondhand Canon digital camera. <gasps> oh. So that, that is just like sort of early 2010s tech or maybe, yep. maybe even before then. But it's it's just a – for me, it's a cool feeling just to take that one photo instead of 20 or 30 on your mobile yeah. and then the actual physical transition to that device to see it on a bigger screen. But, I mean, on the flip side, you realize how good your – and how convenient your phone camera is and how <laughs> they actually help you take better images. Mm. But just that tactile nature of turning on the camera, pointing it and pressing shoot is really nice. 
Um, it is. There's a yeah. thoughtfulness to that process, right? There's just something a bit more. Yeah, a bit more meaningful yeah. taking mm. a snap. Um, and yeah. the weight. Oh, yeah. I think actually the weight of the camera makes a difference. Um it's yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. It's that, that's a really good point, actually. We and would you we did instantly a look like a tourist. <laughs> wherever you are. Yeah. Yep. Put a target on your back, you know, if you're in somewhere like Rome. Oh, well, look at me with have you have you got it on a strap around your neck or have you managed to avoid doing no, that? I'm, I'm not that I'm not that sort of um US <laughs> or <you>. sort of <laughs> yank tourist yet. But I, I you know, could be. Nice, nice, nice. <laughs> now for me. The and this is going to sound funny. Well, actually, I mean, not not dissimilar actually to your example, where we're not talking really analog technology like a rotary mm-hmm. phone or something. Uh, it's more a previous version. But I'm a big fan of seeing movies in the cinema, yeah. big screen, enjoying the surround sound, the dark space, you know, and really getting absorbed in in a movie. And it it yeah. really stood out to me actually last week. I'm a big sci-fi fan and uh, Dune 2 is coming out in a matter of weeks and I had yep. not actually got to see Dune 1 due to all sorts of busyness. And so um, a couple of us went to IMAX and so saw Dune in IMAX. And, you know, it's – and in the music, like it's so dramatic, in fact, the, the chairs shake at some yeah. points. Oh, wow. um, but, yeah, cinema, like actually going to the movies, I like I love the fact we've got so much stuff – accessible on our TVs at home. Um, and it's great that people can even watch stuff, you know, when we're on the bus and everything. But to me, that immersive experience at the cinema is just second to none. I love it. It's it's one of my one of my happy places for sure. I love that. I think too, like it's just one of those places where you actually can't be distracted or doing mm. something else. Um, exactly. And just on that sort of sci-fi angle that you brought up there, Peter, you know, I remember when I think Boris Johnson swiftly took over from to meet uh, Theresa May as Prime Minister of the UK. It would have been 2019. And people took to the streets to rally and to protest. And this is only relevant if you've seen Star Wars. But I remember there was a guy with this handwritten sign that said, at least Chancellor Palpatine was democratically elected. And this is what this <laughs> transition feels like, Peter. This is not what the people wanted to see with this fantastic podcast. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> Oh, sneaking in a Star Wars reference. It just doesn't get better than that, really. You know, I feel like yeah. my work here is done. <laughs> oh, it literally is. Oh, probably the next 30, 40 exactly. minutes. Exactly. It is. It, it is done. It is done. Oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. Now, we've eased it in, folks. So, Patrick, you were keen to sort of grill me on our tech stack. Um, and in preparation, I thought, oh, you know what? That would be an interesting summary, wouldn't it? And we've sort of got – We've got a sort of a big tech audit list and we've yeah. got all that sort of stuff. But I thought, all right, Petty, you know, what are the key things? I started writing. I'm like, oh, wow, there's a lot of things on that list. So yeah. the list so, just um, goes and goes and goes. I think right? I think every time tech is mentioned, not just on this podcast, but on the suite of, of series that have been on the Ensemble um, channel, whenever an advisor or a professional is talking about tech in their own business, I always mm-hmm. just lean in and yeah. maybe just stop what I'm doing and just go, What are they about to say? What are they using? Yeah. And what a fantastic opportunity for while I've got you stuck here, Peter, (laughs) in your grand finale, just to unpack the stack of Mm. Caboodle Financial Services and just do that deep dive. Um, And we can even talk about uh, what's coming up as well, maybe for this calendar year. and For sure. Yeah, maybe other tools as well, not just the sort of um, essentials. Big big chunkies. Shall we start with with CRM? Do you even use a CRM? Yeah. Tell me it's X plan. (laughs) No, it's not. Um, And there's an interesting story here. So we use Zoho, uh, which you listener may not have heard of, but it's basically a version like Salesforce. It's in that category. Um, And it's actually our second type of that type of CRM. We used to use Infusionsoft. Mm. Yeah. And- it all came about because for longer than a decade, I've been really obsessed with automating the little stuff. Yeah. And it, back then, it just simply wasn't something that any of the tools in our industry were doing. They certainly had workflows, you know, so yeah. it could then push you to go, hey, that's the next thing you need to do. Make sure you set that task or, hey, that's the, you know, so it's sort of well, the tools had that, but it didn't set up the four things and and click right. there and add that field, you know, like that level of automation. Whereas 
CRMs in the bigger world outside of our industry have been doing that stuff for years. Yeah. And so it's like I literally went to a conference overseas um, and a, a really, you know, like a CRM conference and just sat mm-hmm. there listening to what truck drivers were doing with their little <laughs> businesses thinking, okay, yeah. their leagues ahead of where I'm at. So yeah. it, um, yeah, so we, we've got this focus on automating the little stuff. And so that's mm-hmm. why we've got, a, you know, a CRM like Zoho. Yeah. And so to describe the sort of thing I'm talking about, so for example, and customization, right? I can completely customize the thing, which, you know, the minute, you know, the listener hears that word, you know, warning Will Robinson, um, yep. the last thing most people or most advisors or practices should do is design from scratch their own tool, yep. honestly. Yep. Um, it's just that our practice is we're operating at the lower margin end of of the world for right. clients. So we, uh, and intentionally, um, and mm-hmm. so we had to find every possible uh, spare moment and minute and <laughs> bit of efficiency and have needed to do that for, you know, 15 years. So for example, in terms of the layout, when you log into our CRM, mm-hmm. then the home screen for a client file, you know, when you log into a certain client is completely designed by us. So to the extent that the top banner changes color for certain things. So oh. if there's a specific issue going on for that client that's really important and urgent and everybody in the team needs to be aware, it's red in that top banner just so we're like, Whoop. okay, something going on. Yeah. If it's a new client, new to Kabutal, and we want to make sure we're a bit ex- not hel- helpful in terms of more service, just aware that they might not know yeah. how we do things and yeah, exactly. you know, heads yeah. up, it's green. Yep. Um, if it's an archive client, it's gray. So things like that, I'm trying to get us to the point where almost anybody could sit in the seat and start nice. and it's it's bringing what they need right in front of them. So that type of thing we can customize in, in Zoho. Um, yeah. One of the other things that has transformed the way we hire and sort of set up our tasks, we've created something that – so we created this little module – in mm-hmm. Zoho, um, it's sort of like a connector, and it's we call it our action form. Right. Basically, it's and if you could take a call, anybody in the team could take a call from a client, mm-hmm. and based on that call, you you select things in the action form, and it pushes off tasks, requests, nice. auto emails, all sorts of, sorts of things to one, other members of the team. It sets up new little mini projects if it's a big thing, it, like all that sort of stuff. And it walks you through even all the things you need to be aware of yeah. and ask for from that client. So we've just sort of found that democratized who can help mm. clients, if you know what I mean. So it really lets anybody take some action for the client um, and it means they can get really adding value very quickly. So if we we don't have a PY, but if we had somebody like that join the practice, they'd be able to actually get on and even just take calls pretty quickly. Because yeah. um, they can at least just respond and be helpful um, because yeah. of the action form. There's yeah, there's real power in giving that tool to someone just to triage something, like just to exactly. know that it's not it's sitting in someone's email inbox or in Slack, uh, and it's consistent too. So you actually know what's happening now and tomorrow and the next thing and the next thing. That yeah. that's is so powerful. And yeah. So you've obviously out of the box that has come with all the tools that maybe a base CRM really needs. Yeah. But then you've built on that to suit Caboodle. Yeah. So you've created your own silver bullet, essentially. Yeah, with a, a, a productivity, I guess, or automation focus. Whereas yeah. I think for a lot of practices, and I completely understand why the focus is, say, advice generation. Like yeah. they see that as the thing. And so there's CRM centers around that. Definitely. Um, that's a perfectly logical choice uh, for I me, agree. And for I them. think just staying in, staying in one system sometimes mm-hmm. beats – something else that maybe does 10%, 20% more things. Right, um, right. And, you know, and yeah. it's it's and it look, we've been we've been lucky because so for advice production, so the sort of advice we're doing is certainly at the simpler sort of yeah. end. Um and so for a long time we were just using our own templates, right? I mean, it really was right. that type of thing, right? It just didn't anytime we used a tool like the usual names um, that everybody would advise mm-hmm. production. It took far longer in the tool <laughs> than it did yeah. in it just because of the type of work we were doing. Um, now, that's changed a bit over time and actually Zoho Zoho is a suite of tools, yes. a bit like Microsoft is, I guess. Yeah. Um, and so they have something called Zoho Writer, 
right. that's a document merging and and sort of um good uh, you know document production tool and so we yeah. now use we trigger the creation of something like a say a review from within Zoho and it's edited within Zoho and gets then oh, nice. you know sent off to the client and the client signs it from within Zoho so there's a Zoho sign oh, so there's brilliant. a whole lot of different elements that they oh, have add-ons yeah. Yeah. yeah so that's that's really great to hear so you're not actually just um you know exporting CRM data into like a Google Doc or Microsoft Word, you're actually yeah. making those edits without leaving the tool as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it, it is interesting, isn't it? Because it's something that people have struggled, like we all do, like you do the clever generation, comes up with mm. the 80-page horrible thing and then <laughs> we extract it and in Word, then we do yeah. tidy, 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 make look yeah. pretty, you know, like. And then someone turns track changes on and it's all over. Yep. Oh, it God. And, yep. and it's And honestly, the minute, you go from the take it out of there into somewhere else, you're yes. instantly into non-productive time, in my view. An yes. advisor should not yes. be doing that second step. You know, it's yes. crazy. You've gone, you're doing the, technically maybe even the advice production step, you know. I could argue um, thinking through the advice, really getting it to that point and then getting somebody else to create a document. But anyway, you know, each practice is different um, and, so then, yeah, but that tidy thing that, oh, we've got to move this table over here and it, oh my God, just drives me nuts. So yeah. we, we like you say, in the beauty of Zoho is you you tweak anything in the writer itself uh, and it then gets converted to PDF, um, you know, locked uh, and then you can either send it direct through their sign tool, which is a bit like nice. DocuSign, yep. um, or, you know, it can be posted out or whatever you, you know. Your other other way of getting things to clients are uh, so Perfect. so yeah amazing mm. and then I assume as part of that suite you're also maybe integrating other tools as well or is there not that really that need there for that yeah so look I'm a big fan of integration um, it's always been much harder than I'd like yeah. so we do so we've got some um, elements of integration for example we've we've folded in uh, SMSs so we can. Mm -hmm. We've got a, a template of, of SMSs we use for particular situations. That's embedded now in Zoho so we can press a button, pick the template and off it goes and it gets saved against the record, you know, that sort of stuff. Yep. Um, so then in terms of um, other, I'm just trying to think of their particular, that's, the, that's actually the one that made a huge difference. We were finding follow-ups was really yeah. high. And yep. and SMS is perfect for that. It just it's, breaks through often. It does. And not everything needs to be an email. Like we've had no. a similar experience. It's just sometimes, yeah, one or two sentences saying either I've sent you this or I'm going to send you this can prime the client to be like, okay, now I'm expecting this. They might yeah. have to check the junk inbox. But then the yeah. risk is you start to have text messages that go for pages and pages and pages because it looks quite small on someone's desktop or screen, but when they send it, it's actually going to a phone. So yeah. it's real. Uh, yeah, and look, we had to make a bit of a call too about what uh, SMSs are used for. So for us, mm. we never use them for marketing, or like nice. for generic stuff. Yep. Ours is we need you to do this thing. <laughs> so it's, it's like they, tool. Yep. yeah, so they know, hey, it's time to book in a review, or it's like anything they need to act. We'll use the SMS, and the, and you can tell the clients sort of get used to that because we might have emailed, we might have called and left a message, but. The SMS is always get a response, and often the first line of the response is, "Oh, so sorry, I haven't." Blah 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 blah. Yeah, <laughs> and they act so amazing. We just find that's a way to cut through. Oh, and man. the what you're insinuating there too is that it's a two way SMS. So yes. some tools, legacy tools, just send it out maybe from a different number each time, and you can't reply. But that actually improves your client engagement. They can actually respond to it in the same. Correct. App. Correct. So, yeah, we ended up paying so that we had a number for the business yep. um, and use a service like that. And then, um, yeah, it, it's so the integration does work both ways and it pulls it into the system and makes a record of the reply, which is great. Nice. Um, the other thing we've done actually as an add-on, just as – because it's interesting, integrations can be awesome, but also they can like accidentally skip a step. So what yeah. we realized is – um, with so say with your email, when a client emails back, well, you know, like eventually you're going to get to that, right? You'll see it because it'll be in your inbox. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you do this sort of thing with SMS, there's not an inbox people have open all the time for that. Right. It's it's a bit different. Um, and so we realized, you know, there were responses coming back. How we need to be flagged for that. So actually, what we've got is 
the responses actually go into a channel in Slack and ah. we'll see them there. So the team are like, oh, okay, quick, go in, to, you know, go in and look at that and, and act. So we yep. sort of use Slack as our a flag hub, you know, like it's okay. we get our phone messages. So we've got a phone message service and yep. – all of those go into the uh, channel in Slack and we've also got the SMSs, the return SMSs, and they go in yeah. and our team just have a way of handling that stuff so everybody knows which one's been actioned. We do actually have a sort of soft phone telecom special coming up in the future of this podcast. Mm. You just mentioned there a messaging service. Is that someone else answering the phone or it's going yes. straight to voicemail? or how does Yes, that work? exactly. So we've got soft phones because we're all virtual so we can call – you know, through a, an app, yep. Yep. which is great. Um, yep. And the power of that and being able to send messages and all that, like, or sorry, mm-hmm. being able to forward calls and everything. But we've also got, um, as a backup, human beings, you know, in a little mini yep. call center awesome. who, yep. if nobody answers the phone, take a message um, and they get certain details and it pushes, you know, they basically normally they email with the message. But what we've done is push those emails into a channel in Slack and we just found we've got quite a broad demographic of clients, but we've found we've got a number of older clients and mm. the voicemail thing just doesn't quite work. We found yeah. we weren't getting enough info, whereas having somebody that chats to them, at least they've spoken to somebody, they know they've taken a message, yep. hey, it's gone through, um, and then we can act accordingly. So we just love having that backup. Uh, um, our aim isn't so to have too many getting handled by them, but we just have it right. on all the time. Um, and also, also during the breaks, you know, if we've got the office shut down, at least somebody's there taking messages, telling people we're not back until whatever date, and there's an escalation nice. thing we put in place. So nice, yeah, that's really cool. And so, what you were alluding alluding to before there was, if if someone is maybe leaving a voicemail, they don't have the confidence that it's going to be listened to or responded to. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, there? yeah, because it's not actually talking to a human. It's a in their head. It's like the task isn't complete. Yes. You know, whereas I, totally I think once you speak to somebody, even if it's not the person you're looking for, it's like, oh, well, at least yeah. I've ticked that thing off. You know, it's yeah. it, I've handballed it. <laughs> I'm with you. And, yeah, it's, it wouldn't be uncommon for someone to send an email, say, hey, I've just left you a voicemail, or a yep. message to say, hey, I've just left you a voicemail. I'm totally yep. with you. Exactly. Okay. No, exactly. that's fantastic. We're definitely unpacking the stack, and I'm uh, it's making me very excited. So <laughs> moving on, I guess, to the, the productivity suite. So we mentioned that we're not really using um, – you know, word processing tool for advice documents. Yes. But, I mean, Google versus Microsoft, where do you stand? What are you using? Yeah. Oh, look, if we'd had this conversation mm, even six months ago, but certainly a year ago, I'd be, well, we're Google, but I would be crowing and excited and I think you're all crazy to be on Microsoft would be the sort of tone I would have, right? Right. We are. Um, In part because, because, Google Suite is properly cloud, like it lives properly in the cloud. Yes. Microsoft tries very hard to do that, but it's not really. Like it's just not. And even when you're using, say, Excel via the cloud, like you can't get all the features or you can't, like the whole, it's clunky as, like in my experience, clunky as hell, right? Yeah, it just feels a bit off. Yeah. It does, right? And so, and then, you know, versions of documents and all this craziness. Um, G Suite handles that like an absolute champ. Um, and yep. so we've had that for some years. The reason um, my tone on that has changed a little is with Copilot yes. coming out from Microsoft, then the genius that is going to deliver mm. to practices, I think, I reckon, you know, you and I may have our head around that better than most, yeah. um, but I think what we can grasp is about one one hundredth of the value that's going to come out of having tools truly talking to each other from within Microsoft. Um, Definitely. It, the I, I magic is going to be unbelievable. I think so. I, I, yeah. Yeah, I, I 100% agree. I think even even now, like I've started without giving anything away, we use Microsoft, but <laughs> using Copilot in terms of we've just got the one license, which I'm selfishly using. Yeah. But the features that are seeming to come out of it on a daily basis are starting to wow me even more. This yeah. seems probably quite simple, but – um, working in a different time zone, there's you know waking up and it's like a bomb's gone off with notifications everywhere and something's happened, etc. But now you can actually just say, "What have I missed?" In yeah. maybe a group conversation with the whole team. Uh, and just recently, it was 
reception announced that they were organising an ergonomic assessment for the reception team. The coffee machine crisis in the ground floor kitchen was averted and the machine is now working fine. It was Christy's <laughs> birthday and many colleagues wished her a happy birthday. Like that yeah. sort of stuff. Like it just gives yeah. me, instead of 30 messages, three bullet points of what I actually missed. So yeah. you just don't have to go into that context switching drain that is checking messages. Look, and it's an interesting it's a really interesting point to grasp that I think takes people a long time to get their head around. And, you know, listeners, stick with me a second. The way we run our days at the moment, thinking, I'm thinking, use email as an example, is where everybody has to experience everything that everybody's doing fully. Yes. So, you know, we CC everybody and everything. So everybody has to read that email. Some will respond, some not, but we've all got to go through the process of reading it and processing and analyzing. Like all this, and to your example, even with feeds in certain channels, whether you use Slack or whatever you use, it could be Teams, whatever it is, everybody's got to experience all of that interaction. The truth mm. is most of it you don't. You just don't need to, but we're all and, – yep. and it's so ineffective right it's it's almost like the worst version of open plan imagine if every you're in an open plan office and everybody yelled out what they were doing all the time it's just we don't exactly. all need to experience this it's just yeah. not it's not the way to keep people up to date unfortunately oh um God. it feels like that's what's necessary it is not and so i love that idea i love getting highlights right being able to just and even for meetings yeah. you know imagine and I'm sure any BDMs or anybody in a corporate listening right now, you know, would just mm. crow about this. You know, imagine turning up to only a quarter of the meetings you currently do because you get a summary yeah. out of the meeting. Yeah. You know, you don't need to be there because you're not actually participating so much as you yeah. were going to listen in. Just, they're just listening to the same presentation over and over right. and over. Just done right. properly differently. And oh just my on goodness. That, with the, just the example there of not needing to, um, hear everything or see everything, it's even now bringing communications from all the Microsoft tools into one yep. summary too. So I think Stephen Handley from Fin365 on one of your earlier episodes mentioned that they actually banned um, email as a comms tool for for internal comms and yep. Teams is the only way to communicate. Yep. All it takes is one or two people sending an internal email um, for that to break and you yep. can go, you're naughty, stop doing that, get back in line and get back on Teams Yep. Or you can just have the co-pilot tell you that this is all of the communications that they've sent you and these yes. are from the different channels. Maybe the yes. channel doesn't even matter. Right. Well, and that's something I'm trying to get my head around actually from a CRM perspective is um, where, and we'll get to this in sort of new project stuff, but we're sort of focusing on a new niche. I'm building out a new program to deliver to them mm -hmm. um, and, and engaging via different channels. So I'm sort of chatting on a bit of Facebook Messenger. Sometimes it's on Instagram. So, yeah. you know, Clients think in multi-channel. In fact, none of those yes. things, uh, they differ, whereas actually that's very hard to manage in terms of having one single source of truth of the interactions you've had with somebody. So, you know, I'm getting my head around that for our CRM and I'm sure, you know, the listeners, you, you may not be there now, but I think you'll find you're going to get there in the future. Definitely. Yeah. Um, I can't think of a good segue to, to move on from that, Peter, but <laughs> if we think about maybe a recent episode you've had with Suitability Hub Yep. And I think I know the answer to this one, but in terms of um, product comparison, so mm -hmm. the products themselves and the investment products, what are you using there? Yeah, so product Rex is a core part of, of what mm -hmm. we use. Um, I've got to give Nick huge chops for yeah. understanding Incredible. a specific requirement yeah. and delivering a tool that knocks it out of the park, yeah. you know, and, and, and people are like, really? I mean, it just – because it's, it's not – super complicated. It's not many layers. I get that. But I mm. wish more people were building things like that for our industry. I think there's there's too many trying to build the big thing. Yeah. You know, and what we need are these wonderful now, what will end up happening is often these tools will then get folded into something. Yes. That's cool. But he started with a singular purpose. He had a unique insight. He got it. He, yeah. He'd ex personally experienced the frustration of trying to do that thing yeah. and he solved it. And, you know, bless his cotton socks, I've got to say. I mean, we're at the point now where it's just made. So even even because remembering we've got this simple sort of clients, we, we're not using an X plan or anything with those sort of data feeds. Mm -hmm. So in terms of even just your reviews, do we need to make switches, you know, that sort of stuff, it's super yeah. easy. Yeah. Um, we can – 
easily do a little cross check to check against platforms just to make sure there's nothing out there that seems, you know, maybe has popped up that's better value. All those things used to be so hard to do. Yeah. yeah. And it's it's super easy. Um so yeah, we we absolutely love that. I've got to say though, um the suitability hub from a broader feature mm. level is really exciting. Yeah. Really exciting because the other hard task we all have is when we are doing those comparisons, we all lead with cost. Yes. And that's not nearly enough. And so then you've you've got to do all that digging on individual features and it's so hard. Yeah. Like <laughs> yeah. trying to compare and line them up and and to have a tool coming out that um you know, we can say, hey, this is the the five things the client yeah. really and wants. The process we went through, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, they really want this. We know they're going to need these. Hey, tell us who rates. I mean, that's yeah. fabulous. Yeah. It's, um, it's amazing. And once again, another example of someone who's been in the chair or experienced that pain has gone out and built it and done something about it. So Exactly. They're always the tools that win. Um, right. Yeah, exactly. It's just how, with you. how it goes. Yeah. Yep. Amazing. And then you mentioned, obviously, you're not using the heavy hitting uh, advice tools, mm. but what about uh, sort of projections and, and financial modeling? What are you sort of using there? Yeah. So I, um, it's a, it, we, we did a bit of a, um, a hunt actually last year. So mm. we, we sort of did on the, you know, perused all the options. And yes. that's it was a difficult a process actually because you know my ba- so my background is actuarial studies you know I'm a massive I mean I used to work as an analyst in in corporate finance right so I love me an Excel spreadsheet so um, it's it's interesting to separate yourself from what you might find interesting and fun to tinker with yes. versus what delivers the results you need as a business for the particular mm-hmm. reason you need it. Um, so for us, modeling is less about what I will call financial engineering. You know, that sort yes. of um, Let me craft pull out money here, recontribute here, yep. you know, like that really boxes and yeah. arrows sort of modeling. Yeah. And it's more about really giving them a sense of the future possibilities do they have enough style of sort of analysis? And so once I got my head around that and I stopped getting caught in the, ooh, this is really tricky and complicated, um, then it became as, as much – so two things became really important. One was how it looked. You know, what did the output look like? Yeah. Um, and we so we chose on that basis Voyant one for us. Mm-hmm. And, it, and interestingly – so it's got the normal graph, you know, in a normal graph, it's like your net wealth over time or, or your assets over time. Yeah. What Voyant does, which was a bit different for us, was it lets you have stages of their life. So it's like the first band in red or in green mm-hmm. is the kids are at school and the next band is is you're, you're on your own yeah. in the house but you're still working and the next band is the go-go years in retirement when you're still active and you're traveling and then the no-go years when you're like so. Mm-hmm. So it lets us sort of break it, the timeline down on, on that graph for clients. So I think they sort of connect to it better because they can see right. how it does change based on those sort of stages. Yeah. So uh, that's that's a really great concept, a way of looking at it. I think, yeah, turning someone's life into a, a movie or a series or even yeah. just chapters. Yeah. Um, because it is so easy to be looking at, what are we now, 2024, and you're looking at 2050 and just the <laughs> – it's like looking at big numbers. Eventually they just turn into mush and it's just so hard to visualize. A hundred percent. And and we make so many assumptions about what clients can absorb, um, and I I'm, I would argue it, even advisors can't absorb all that data in a hit. Yeah. I mean, how many of us have been to the you know wonderful uh, fund manager economist session when there's forty slides with all the graphs and you just sit there and in the end yeah. you're just in zombie. You're like yeah. that. That's pretty. That's a blue line. Like you just. <laughs> Yeah. Just stop. Absorbing. It really favors the presenter because they've seen it before, right. they've built it, they've done it 10 times. 100%. But when you're seeing it for the first time and they're rushing through it, it's just uh, it's information you know, overload. It's- Correct. So, so the way it, it the outputs it produced, um, I was less worried. You know, I didn't really require them to be able to play with it at this point, but I did want it to sort of produce something that I felt was engaging. Yep. Um, that was the first yep. requirement. The second one was we could produce those things without um, it taking hours and hours to get the data nice. in. So yep. that was the other thing. Um, and 
you know, there's, I mean, I've got a bit of a pet peeve of the way we use analysis tools yeah. where you've got to be, you know, your scenarios and then you've changed one thing, but it's not updating on the others. And, you know, well, the other 16 awesome. scenarios, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it's it's so dangerous. And without some real rigor in the way you approach that, then your numbers can just be way off. So I wanted yeah. something that was really um, easy to get to that point because in my head, some of mm. that modeling, if it's just for somebody that's more life coaching style as opposed yeah. to complex financial solution style, I might be able to have another member of the team produce that modeling that then an advisor checks yes. rather than, um, you know, the advisor doing it. So, so yeah, that's, that's how we got to Voyant um, for and our modeling tool. The, that's great. And I think the, the reality is financial projections or modeling is one of the few tangible things that we actually do for clients. Yes. A yes. lot of the rest of it is intangible. So yep. you need to make sure that you've got the right tool, that you're actually proud of what you're putting in front of them and that they yep. can actually understand one of the few tangible things that you're delivering. So yeah, I love that. Yeah, 100%. Uh, 100%. And I guess just, just sort of on that topic in terms of really that is client engagement, uh, what are you doing there from maybe a, I've, I've heard you've um, built your own portal, you're on that journey. I'd love to hear a yes. bit more about that. Yes, it's been it's a longer journey than I'd hoped to be. Look, I'm I am eternally optimistic with this sort of thing. It's probably one of my greatest weaknesses where where in my head, the minute I've chosen the tool, it's already implemented. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which clearly is not the case. <laughs> it's clearly an implementation process. And yeah. I think we're pretty good at implementation, but it's just in my head, it's always, yeah. well, you know, it's got to be faster. Why can't we do this yeah. faster? So we selected um Moxo as a portal tool. Yes. And once again, the decision was based on our unique requirements or our specific leading requirements. So yeah. we found, and we talked to a lot of clients about this, and they didn't feel a need to be able to log into something and see their balances or have something yeah. that they interacted with in that sense. That wasn't something they were interested in. But having done a lot of cyber risk and scam mm. training and all this sort of stuff for them, particularly through COVID. We were doing a lot of webinars to keep in contact with our clients and they really love yep. them actually. And we've continued them since then. But yep. but um, there was a lot of talk about, you know, emails and passwords and all sorts of stuff. We wanted to give everybody, you know, the, all the insights they needed. Then because of that, quite accidentally, then they're all like, oh, is this something that'll be more secure? You know, so yep. um, the focus was, you know, a way to talk to us, the way they would interact with us. Um, and so to be able to send us a little video or, or a little message or like all those nice. things to be super easy. So it's essentially almost like your virtual office in that, nice. you know, this is where they come for, for meetings. This is where, you know, documents oh. get uploaded. This is where things get signed. This is where all that sort of stuff. So it's very much administration, you know, administration yeah. and, and comms. So um, you've, you've unified that sort of backstage and front stage experience. So you're yeah. living in the same sort of area. Yes. Um, and yes. clients know where to go. There's one place to go for it. It's not an email attachment. Correct. Correct. And we really are trying to get them out of email as much as mm. humanly possible. I think, you know, email is a Trojan horse for all of us. Um, yep. And uh, I get that we're all used to using it, but um, I think, you know, it's, yeah, it's it, getting them out of that and um, getting them used to interacting with us uh, via something. That, I, I mean, I sort of described it to one client because we're, we're sort of rolling it out now with a few people to get them really actively using it and get their feedback. Yeah. And he sort of couldn't quite get his head around because this is an older client too. So we're really trying hard to sort of get that experience and understand their feedback. Get them on board. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and, <laughs> and he's like, Peter, what do you mean? I went, it's like the bat phone. <laughs> This is the bat phone for Kabul. He's like, oh, right. it's like it's the direct way to yeah. get to us. <laughs> exactly. You know, so he, he really, so that's sort of um, how we want to position it for them. This is the way yeah. to get to us. Um, you know, we had a lot of fun naming it because it's actually the Moxo mm. tool is your own actual app. So, you know, somebody downloads something from either Apple or, oh, right. you know, so Okay, yeah. so it's actually on their mobile device. Amazing. Yes. So it's not not only a web portal, but no, uh, both amazing. No, and there was that was intentional. Um, mm -hmm. I realised having done, I've done, a, you know, I've got a bit of a um, online course addiction. I will admit yeah. to because I love learning new things. Right. And the my experience or the extent to which I engaged was very different when somebody had a tool that gave me notifications on my phone. So if it was an actual app, mm -hmm. it can nudge you. 
And so there was one course where it's like, come on, this week's activity is this. I'm like, oh, yeah. bugger. Yep. Okay. You know, and I just do it. Whereas the problem with any web portal is somebody has to go in to mm. actually get notifications or you're just adding time. more to their email. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And or you're just adding more emails to them because they get notified via email, which people have just conditioned to ignore. So we yeah. just found in terms of that cut through, like just getting them to push you to the top of their list of to-dos, then yep. being an actual app meant they got those notifications. So that was part of the decision-making process for us too. Does that, does that mean if they're on their app and you mentioned the ability to join meetings via their two, a lot of clients joining meetings from their phone or how, how yeah. does that sort of work? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. So it can be, so they can choose to. Getting a sort of HC view up the nostrils of your clients on the couch, et cetera. <laughs> Which is hysterical. So yeah, you get all of that experience. Um, it could be they can, you know, some of them choose to do audio only. You know, so it's more like just a phone okay. call. Yeah. Um, but the other cool thing is any of those can be auto recorded and just nice. saved against their record. So yeah. when you're doing a briefing about something, they love the fact that yes, you know, and they're listening and they're absorbing and all that sort of stuff. And I can, you know, you can even be going through a document on screen and then they'll get the chance to to listen through that again um later on. So yeah, we just amazing. we just love that rigor. Um and really sort of giving them like not control as much as as access you know it's it's just all of that info it's all there they don't need to try and trawl through all of their files or all of their emails yeah. they know where to go to get it so so yeah it's it's pretty exciting actually but like i say it's taken a lot it because it's not an industry tool it is once again like as her choice yeah. it's an external tool yep. you've got to build out that functionality that's taken a bit longer than i would have liked so we're still in sort of that beta phase testing um but I'm pretty excited for how um, it will transform follow-ups. You know, those SMSs yeah. we're talking about, yeah. well, they won't be an SMS anymore. Yeah. They'll be in the app. Um, yeah. And what's cool, so the difference is if I was to describe our Zoho process currently, we've got something that might go out. Let's use a popular topic like a uh, consent form. Mm -hmm. V consent form, yep. right? So your renewal's gone out to the client. They need to get it back to you. It hasn't come back. So we will have a reminder task in Zoho to say, nice. hey, yeah. you know, service person, admin person, hey, we need to follow that up. So whether they call or they SMS or all that sort of stuff, right? So yeah. yes, there's an element of automation in terms of the follow-up tasks and we've got templates for the SMS, but the whole thing still requires a person to trigger it. Yep. In Moxo, um, you set up these little flows that are like a, a certain experience, short experience, okay. and there will be a deadline for the client to get you back the form. And if the mm -hmm. deadline passes, it automatically nudges them via a notification nice. to say, ooh, you've missed your deadline. You still owe us something. So that doesn't require us to, to do, trigger that at all. It's just yep. going to happen. So in terms of the volume of workload, we have a huge volume that's just follow-ups. So I'm excited about the extent to which it's really going to yeah. you know, release some bandwidth for the team. And that is that is not an enjoyable activity for team members no, to do. It's is so to say, frustrating. hey, I'm going to bug you for the sixth time about mm. this thing you still haven't done. Like you can start to feel annoying as a team member as well, uh, especially when it's a consent form. Like, yes. hey, you need to sign this so you can pay us. Like it's just yeah. not a fun activity. So that makes total no. sense in terms of automation. I love yeah. that. Um, yeah, and sure. apps like, for example, Duolingo are very good at that too. Like mm. if you're learning a language and you're trying to um, – you know, they want you on there to upgrade to their paid plan. So they're pinging you every day to say, hey, keep up your streak, you know, or don't, like if that's not what you want to do. Like they're really good at cutting through with really clear and effective yep. uh, communication. So that's really yeah. cool. And it always seems to come through at the right time of day too, like somehow. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure absolutely. What that, but All that magic, yeah. right? All of that magic. And, yeah, and definitely. yeah, that's where I'm excited. Um, using a tool outside the industry too, generally because I've got to compete amongst all those industries, Generally, they're bringing out those um, sort of new features a lot faster than we yeah. would see them otherwise, nice. which is exciting too. Yep. Yeah. They've got yeah. a reason to innovate. I love that. And it's always yeah. great to to sort of cherry pick from what other industries are doing or industry agnostic yes. techs and apply that to Absolutely. financial planning or professional Absolutely. advice. Um, so obviously, you mentioned that was a massive project and you mentioned the, the modeling mm -hmm. project as well. I assume uh, even though you've implemented it in your head, you're still managing that. <laughs> with some sort of tool and people are doing things like 
research or implementing the thing. What are you using from like a project and a task management perspective, Peter? Yeah, we um, there have been so many. If if there's one that's taken as many versions to get right, it's this. Mm-hmm. Okay. So we're we're using Asana now. Right. Um, I'm very happy with Asana. Um, yeah. We found lots of the tools overcooked things and it took as much time kept maintaining it as it did just using it. Mm-hmm. Um, so we've really loved Asana and it beautifully integrates with all sorts of other things as well. So it integrates with Slack and all that sort of stuff. Um, yeah. We even use – so we have little mini projects for meeting types, meaning let's say yeah. it's just our weekly sort of, you know, weekly team meeting, we have that as a project. It's got an agenda that sits in that project. We we share the screen. We talk through the agenda, knock things off. Any tasks get entered into Asana live in the meeting. There's no need yep. for minutes. There's no need, you know. So it's all right there. Um, and during the week, if someone's like, oh, I need to bring that up at the meeting, they can just add it straight into Asana and it's sitting there yep. waiting for us and it's already on the agenda. So, you know, we found it actually working really well. Uh, for yep. the team, I love the fact that it's it can look like a project management tool. It can look like Trello and have boards. Right. Like it just depends on yep. what you're using it for for each individual project. So well, really happy in, with Asana. I mean, if you're international, it should be Kanban, but really it's Kanban. Yeah, um, <laughs> that sort of thing. So making a visual a visual yes. way to actually view your projects where they where they're at and where they're going. Yeah, amazing. Yep. So for example, I use that version, the sort of boards and things like that, for yep. just collecting ideas for certain topics. So I can just dump them into columns. Nice. Um, as I come up with, you know, I'll, I see something like, oh, that'd be a cool social media yeah. post. I can just dump it in. So oh, nice. each sort of project in there will be form a very different function. Yep. Um, but. And what I've added to it, I haven't done this for the team because they don't need it really for their work. A lot more of my work is project-based, right? So okay, whether it's yeah. rolling out things like tech or it's building yeah. the new program or all that sort of stuff, whereas most of theirs is more functional and, and their tasks are triggered mainly by Zoho. So that's sort of where they sure. live. Um, for me, a lot of mine are these chunky time you've got to spend on things. So I've added to Asana something called Reclaim, right. Reclaim.ai. And what it does is any task that you – sort of add reclaim to, it says, all right, how long do you need to do it? And when do you want to start doing it? Not when, Mm -hmm. so it already knows when it's due because Asana asks that, but when do you want to start? And it uses AI to push the tasks into your calendar. So anybody who's used time blocking, the challenge with that in your calendar is you end up just moving things all the time, right? right? (laughs) It's like, I didn't get to that today. I'm going to drag it across. This just does all of that for you. You tell it the priorities, you tell it the regular things you want to be done and it just pushes it into your calendar. And if you don't get to it, it moves it forward based on those priorities and how, how overdue it is. Nice. So I just That's find magic. in terms of being, yeah, to be able to knock things off, it'll even break it up. If you say, yeah, yeah, it's four hours, but you can break that up into, you know, one hour blocks if you need to, then it'll yeah, push cool. it into different sections. So I've just found in terms of really getting through project things, it's broken yeah. my sort of mental block that's, oh, God, that's this massive eight-hour yeah. task. And you sort of can't get your head around and when you're going to fit it in. So Reclaim does that for me. That's perfect. And, I mean, you're also being able to add to the roadmap of your business too. So it's not just yeah. sitting there as an idea in your own personal note-taking app. It's actually yeah. on the board. Once you say it, someone else might have had that idea too and you can get by in instantly, yeah. even if it's not being worked on right now. That's really great. Yeah. Hundred percent, hundred percent, and there's certain. I've got. The, it's really interesting, actually. Reclaim is um, a lot of these tools are actually being built by people who have ADHD, and so they really struggle to sort okay. of stay focused, and so they need things right. that'll help yeah. them keep them on track, which is really cool. And yeah. so this has the, a, a thing called habits that you want to build, right. and so a habit could be you know going for a walk or things like that, but it could also be just things that you want to you know three times a, a week I want to do this type of thing. So maybe. I want to research social media ideas or I want it like what so it actually it's not so much a project for you, you know, right. it's not a task that you complete. It's something that you're regularly doing. Habits, so yeah. it balances all of that for you. And it pushes time into your calendar. Amazing. It's fantastic. Um and actually I've let it get to the point where I use we use Calendly for booking yeah. appointments for clients yeah. and others. And if things are really dire, like you've really got behind <laughs> with your deadlines, yeah. um, then it, if the task it pushes into your calendar, it'll actually show as blocked off time to external parties. So you, they can't nice. book time in. So I'm like, because uh, there was a point where I had somebody say, oh, I can't get in for two weeks. I'm like, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's reclaims going, dude, 
you can't do that. You've got <laughs> to get your task yeah. done. So, which I love, you know, you can't overcommit yourself. I think that, like, obviously the client always comes first. Yes. But the client Clients will come different. first even more if that project gets done. So, yeah. I think that makes total sense. That's great. Yeah. And then I, I suppose we sort of jumped into other tools that you're using regularly. I haven't asked you about sort of office comms, but you've mentioned Slack a few times. So I assume yeah. that what's that is what you're using as a yeah. as a team. That's yeah, just internal are. comms. Obviously you've got the app there. Yes. For the external comms. Yes. So it, it is just internal comms. Um we also have an a no internal internal email policy. Nice. Yep. Um and it's made such a difference to being able to uh, you know, sort of uh, hand over things quickly. So, for example, if somebody's, you know, if somebody's off sick and somebody's got to go in and check the task to see what they've got due and they've got to, you know, all this, oh, is, did somebody leave a whole lot of voicemails for them? Because all of that's coming through Slack, anybody can just quickly handle it. So, we've just found the sort of collaboration element, being able to help each other out, step in. Um, yep. Even, you know, you've got new people and something weird comes up and they go, oh, why is that happening? You know, you can yep. really quickly address it. Um, and for me, and get a resolution. Yeah, yep. yeah, exactly. You know, and I do a lot of presenting and travel around. Um, so sort of on the road and, you know, Slack is where I absolutely live. I don't really need to look at my emails nearly as much, to be honest, but yep. to keep on top of, you know, what the team need from me, if it's urgent, they're putting it in Slack. Um, yep. And they'll tag me and go, "Hey, this is the one thing you need to do. <laughs> Just yep. do this and for it, us." It plays well with other tools too. Like you mentioned, you've got things <sighs> coming coming into Slack yeah. to alert you what's going on elsewhere. So it really does become that sort of central uh, point. I, I know it you does. mentioned as well, you know, in the previous AI episode around, I think using a tool like Guru, for example, for like yes. the internet and LMS and things like that. Yes, and from memory, that also is integrating into Stripe. Into Stripe, into Slack as well. One hundred percent, it does. Yeah. So Guru is our, it's our IP. It's it's our internal how tos, yeah. and you're absolutely right. It'll um they integrate with Slack as well. So if something comes up and it's a discussion about how we do something, or somebody answers a question in Slack, oh, you find that over here. You can just go create a card for Guru out of that discussion, um, and it can just push it straight in. Oh, so. Nice. Yeah, Guru is a living, breathing thing for us. It sits in yeah. the web browser. There's mem- and I can see who uses it and how much and what things they look yeah, at. And some stats, yeah. many member of the team, particularly the support team, um, have it open all day. Wow. Um, you know, so for everything they need, how do I, you know, how do I log into this? What are the steps for that? Um, all yeah. the possible nuances, it's all in there. Um, so it's and another it's, thing. Oh, that's, it's it's also great. Yeah. Yeah, huge, huge difference for onboarding people, getting them up to scratch really quickly, empowering them to do their job rather than sort of micromanaging them. Yes. Um, you know, you do need to keep it up to date. So that's a bit of, yep. of rigor, you know, you've got to apply. Um, but uh, that's actually, that's the thing that comes up most frequently from team meetings is a, we need to update that guru card. Right. <laughs> you know, so, um, but, you know, we've got all of this detail about how we go about things. Uh, it's just so powerful. Yeah, amazing. And there is a lot of power in just that contextual, like you're on a certain site and therefore those cards or whatever they're called are appearing on what's probably going to be relevant for that site. Maybe it's a a platform or another one of the tools that you're using, uh, you know, newly implemented modeling, for example, or the app as well. Um, I mean, what what have we missed? I assume there's other tools. You've covered off on digital signatures too, which is part of Zoho, but I know you're heavy Canva users as well? Like what mm, we I am particularly. Um, Canva is something I probably have open. Well, it might not be every day, but it would okay. be multiple times a week. Yeah. Um, and I think we're probably all underutilizing that. If, yeah. if, if you're in a practice and you engage with clients and you don't know what Canva is, I need you to go in and spend some time playing, please, listener, yeah. because yeah. the presentation templates alone will blow your mind. You you will be able to pull together what would otherwise have cost you $10,000 with a designer in terms of quality, you know, presentations um, and slides. But, yeah, it's just so powerful um, and also, there's just so much you can do with it. So, yeah, Canva is something I live in a lot. Um, Calendly we use a lot. Uh, and I use a fair bit of the automation for Calendly. So, for example, yeah. you know, booking in guests for the podcast. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they book in via a link, but then they get 
you know, a sample of the questions that come out yeah. after that. They get the reminder that it's coming. They even will get a, um, a follow-up after the episode's done and the date's passed that has a link to a little form to ask them how they found it. Um, and we push those answers into a channel in Slack. So I can just see those nice. come in and keep yeah. an eye on, on that feedback. So, yeah, so we use that. Um, we're using Stripe. So we're mm. starting to use that for yeah. the sort of program payments Nice. Um, to make it really easy for pe- people to pay. I know that's something that's debated in the industry and dealer groups have a challenge with that sort of stuff, but the concept okay. of invoicing somebody for something which they would prefer to just pay with a click, I mm. I think we need to sort of move along with this and just make Definitely. it easy for people. Yep. Um, but, yeah, those are the key one. We use RevX for, for revenue. Yep. Oh, the, all of those tools just need to do more for me. Yep. Um, but. But yeah, we use that. And actually, from a marketing sense, um, I'm currently using ConvertKit. So okay. that's sort of for your opt in landing page, email marketing sort of stuff. So that's more about leads. Um, ConvertKit right. just make it super easy. There's great templates. It's all, you know, honestly, it takes you seconds to set it up. I used to have about four different, different tools to do that. And yeah. um, I just find it works really well to just get things knocked up quickly so people can, you know, either register for something or downloadable or you know, that sort of stuff. It's really easy. Oh, lovely. I think just on the on the Stripe side of things, I think the, like that is how most clients in their personal lives are, uh, they're going through that similar experience when they check out and buy something. They're yes. Apple paying for things. Correct. They're signing up to subscriptions. Yeah, it's it's not a modern experience to be, you know, we're not emailing, but emailing out a, an invoice because it's time to pay us or right. filling out a, a PDF or even paper-based forms. Like it's um, it's time it's that we sort of level crazy. up in the world and Stripe makes it really easy too out of the box. Yeah, and, and look, to, and there's lots of them you can choose from. Stripe also Definitely. integrates with a whole lot of things as well. Definitely. So, um, you know, there's some power in that too um, that you can sort of embed it and it all just flows through. Um, and I get it. Look, there's, you know, dealer groups um, or, sorry, licensees, um, you need to have structure and all that sort of stuff. I, I really think they all need to add these tools onto their list for 2024 because more of us are going to be doing, you know, six-month programs or like we're all going to be coming up with new ways to engage as we should and how exciting is that. Yeah. But mm-hmm. when you do that, we can't be using old ways to pay. <laughs> yep. So it can't be this awesome thing we've designed and then what I'm going to do is send you out a carrier pigeon that's going to be carrying the invoice <laughs> for the thing like, holy Toledo exactly. Batman. So I think it's really important that the industry just jumps um, a few steps yeah. ahead on, and, on payment for sure. I mean, we were talking about follow-ups before, but the the issue of failed payments or missed payments, oh. that is is – also, in the current environment, such a headache if you're not using a modern tool to follow yep. up and get the new card details or the new bank details. Like it's yep. just, it should be simple, and also should be not at our end. Meaning, you know, like yes. they should just put that in. We should exactly. not see those details. I don't want to. I don't want any yeah. part of that stuff. Yeah. I don't want to know. You know? Yeah. I, I want somebody else to be collecting that that they're comfortable with that does this for all sorts of people and has all of the protections required. So. Um, yeah, I'm with you. I think, you know, there's, and they're not fly by nighters, these institutions, you know, they're, yeah. yeah, so they're doing this for all sorts of businesses. So, so yeah, I would flag that as one that I think licensees could probably uh, lift the game on for sure. Definitely. Trying to move away from the 1990s tech interfaces of revenue management yes. software. Yeah. Um, even though they got a fresh sort of coat of paint recently. Yeah. Um, and I guess that's, that is, the stack unpacked, Peter, is it? Is it we Pretty much. Else? Look, there's nice. there's always going to be more, but yes, absolutely. Those are sort of the, the yeah. biggies. Um, you know, if there's a listener that's, that's curious about a particular category, hey, pin me on yeah. the Ensemble platform for sure. Yeah. But those are the sort of big categories. Yeah. Nice. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing. Not at all. Um, now, I'm curious. I want to ask you... And listener, we've we are going a bit long, but I figure you're going to stick with us, right? So we, we're this, this is a handover. This requires a bit more attention. Um, <laughs> then I'm curious, you know, for you, what's on your radar this year? What sort of tech things are sort of catching your eye, or things you're going to either dig more into, or you're sort of in the process of implementing? What are some some project plans for you guys this year? I think just for some some context of maybe our. CRM because that's where everything happens. Similar to yourself with mm. with Zoho, we are heavy Salesforce users. Yep, we 
were the first client of of Wealth Connect or Creative Mass. Yes. And yes. Um, most people know how that turned out, but we sort of came out of that unscathed and were able to go our own way and choose our own destiny with our tech stack. Nice. So that's a big part of my role is actually building a lot of the tools that we have and functionality within the Salesforce platform Nice to the extent where we send out uh, client proposals without leaving Salesforce and integrate that with Xero and with Stripe. So, th- I mean, this financial year is probably the first financial year that we've done it in a way that we're comfortable with. We right. um, were able to consolidate an existing tool. But now we're in a position where we can sort of fully automate that renewal process. Uh, and this is also in the context of um, other business lines like accounting and business coaching as well. So if that engagement is coming up for renewal and we can tell that nothing has changed in terms of scope, we can maybe apply a, a business mandated index indexation increase, Yep. Yeah. maybe push it straight to review or actually send it straight out to the client. And because we use Stripe uh, and the payment details are securely saved, they don't have to reach for the wallet again or, or check out again. They can simply consent yep. to that. Yeah, So nice. that's exciting. Mm. Um, on the – we haven't really covered this in terms of the stack, but um, recording meetings and transcription software is becoming more and more popular, uh, especially with financial planning practices. Mm-hmm. But and, – and AI is also helping with that too in terms of summarizing those meetings and giving action yeah. items and key talking points. Yeah. But a lot of them are still just silos of data where you're logging in and viewing what happened in that meeting. Mm. And there's also question marks over the sovereignty of that data. So where is it based? And if you don't renew that plan, whether it's a monthly plan or an annual plan, are you going to see all of those conversations you've had with clients for the last 12 months, 18 months, or however, however long you've had that tool? Yeah. So what we're doing this year is moving away from our existing provider and implementing uh, Firefly's AI, which you might have yep. actually seen on the Ensemble community. Uh, yes. A bit of conversation going on about that. The beauty with Fireflies is it will integrate with Salesforce, which means that we can automatically create a file note for that conversation, throw in the links to the transcript and the, um, the audio of the call, but then also push through the AI components of it too. Oh. So if you think about the action items and the, the summary – your file note's 80 or 90% done and you can also have those tasks ready to be assigned to the right person. So, yeah. I mean, that's, that is a couple of examples. Um, and nice. we're also about to integrate with Voyant as well for modeling as well. So complete your fact find in Salesforce, whether that's client side or the advisor or team side, and then push those inputs into the Voyant scenario. So, nice. Yeah, there are probably three things that we're excited about uh, for this calendar year mm. um, i would love to know yeah about, uh, what's on well, the, we, the roadmap yeah, well, or radar I mean, for yourself too yeah so like you pointed out so we've still got moxo that's sort of a a live one that we're continuing for me so that's the big one that's like the must get done come hella high water project <laughs> the other things i'm checking out is i really am focusing a lot on our experience and whether it's for the new program we're building or our current clients so sort of risk profiling tools, but also other profiling tools. So I'm very close to signing up to do Gallup Strength training so we can use the Gallup Strengths tool to really help people get insight into their DNA and why they do things. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's sort of along that sort of experience journey and, and, you know, risk profiling tools like Capital Preferences and others is the sort of thing we'll be looking at to sort of really lift that game. There's plenty Um, there. Yep. Mm, exactly. Exactly. So finding one that matches us. One that I haven't found a solution for, but I'm still carefully watching is the whole sort of digital ID, AML, mm. um, sort of really easily getting all of that checked and done by an external um, tool or Apple business. Yeah. Um, I think we're all going to need to be there at some point. I can see yeah. that coming. Um, I'm a little provided surprise providers aren't already at that point with sort of some yeah. external sort of things. So I'm keeping an eye on that. I'm waiting for somebody to come up with a, a fabulous, I would call it like a strategy guardrails AI. Mm-hmm. There's a couple that people are playing with, but I'd love to have a tool that advisors and even trainees could use that sort of, uh, hey, here's the the client's data, not so much name or any of those unique yeah. identifiers, but here's their situation. You know, these things are out, these things are in, 
you know, make sure you consider this. So it's it, like I said, just guardrails. I don't need to actually produce the whole advice yeah. or do any of that. It's I just a filtered list of of yeah. eligible scenarios. I thought you could and do, as yeah. part of that sort of best interest sort of process, I love the idea mm. of getting people to really think through that, make sure they've file noted the logic they've gone through. Like I just love the rigor of that. Um, to be honest, it's probably not a complicated AI tool, um, and I right. think there's a few out there that are getting close. Um, so. I'm really excited about that. And aside from that, we'll look at using Zoho more. There's a lot more mm. elements of Zoho, so we'll be looking at all of that. Yep. They've got billings, for example, I've just discovered, that integrates with Stripe. So, you know, there's a whole lot of that that nice. can make life yeah, that can make life easier. Um, the other one is we've got – so our niche we're working on is sort of Gen Xs, and one of the biggest issues for Gen Xs are parents getting older and handling all of that and all of the kerfuffle yep. that goes along with that. And so – we're looking at a tool uh, that I have interviewed actually on the podcast, Airwealth, mm-hmm. actually using that for adult kids to sort of, you know, be coordinated about all the things for their parents. So um, to to provide yep. that to people so they can keep on top of things. Um, so I think, you know, the need for making all of that easier um, and taking the pressure off just one kid out of the however many kids in the family, adult kids, then that's something that's a flag for us. So most of them are sort of watching you know, like waiting for the right thing to come and then we'll leap. I know we've got the need. I just need to find the right tool. Um, but uh, the the key one will be Moxo and then the Zoho, just taking advantage more of Zoho. And look, I think I would put on anybody's list that's listening this year, whatever you have, whether it's Microsoft or whatever things you're already using, paying for, you know, one of your missions this year should be taking more advantage of those tools. Yeah, of the tools uh, you already Learn have, more about them, course. right? Yep. Yeah, Definitely. 100%. Now, That's, yeah. I'm conscious of the fact that we've now been here for well over an hour. We're ticking into an hour 15, and we were going to talk about brand new tech stacks. I reckon what we should promise the listener is that sometime in the future, you will reach out mm. and go, Peter, I think we should have you back to talk about building a tech stack from scratch. What do you reckon? I mean, um, you know, I do have a long list of of uh, attendees, but I, th- I think I can squeeze you in there, Peter. Maybe think- I'll let you know. Well, I have look, your see people how you go. my people. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, exactly. Get links. Exactly, exactly. So I reckon we might, we might, um, yeah, put that on the future because it's probably Definitely. a worthwhile conversation for people to hear. Actually, is is I how think, you know I starting from scratch. At the very least, if we can check in and and see whether we've kept to our promises of what we're doing this year in terms of our own tech stacks. Yes. I think yes. that would be well, maybe that's another episode. We're just patting them out um, and having accountability, time. folks. <sighs> but you just heard um, us put ourselves on the line there. <laughs> exactly, oh, Jeepers. Yeah, but, exactly. Uh, <laughs> but Peter, I must say, you have handled this transition of I won't say power, but this transition <laughs> of host incredibly gracefully. I mean, the only recent comparison I have is Woolworth CEO uh, Brad Banducci. But please, obviously, we've sort of run out of time, so you, you can't really walk out of this interview. No. <laughs> but th- but thank you so much for turning up in our earbuds this week and every other week, uh, seventy plus times, and giving it your all. Your energy is just unmatched, and giving us these weekly te- tech pep talks. Uh, yeah, the energy is just incredible. Thank you for your contribution to Ensemble and the advice community as a whole. I know that's not going away, but um, what no, you've done so far. And if my hosting is half as good as yours, I will be a very happy man. So, Peter, a sincere thank you, and we miss you already. Thank you so much. It has been super, super, super duper fun. A lovely to check to you and get to know you better. I'm really excited um, for where you'll be taking the show. This is super good news, I think, for everybody. It's part of how we do these things, right? We transition to the next wonderful voice and wonderful insights. Um, and listeners, look, I'd love you to give Patrick some love, whether it's on the Ensemble platform or on LinkedIn. Say hi, you know, give him the supportive thumbs up or whichever emoji you choose. Um, but <laughs> Um, yeah, exactly. But reach out and say hi. And, you know, we'll include his LinkedIn um, profile in the show notes. But um, it has been an amazing journey. I have loved every minute and have absolutely taken advantage of all of the interviews I've had for the practice. So on that note, we might leave you for this, this week, um, listeners. And then next week, you'll be hearing from the wonderful Patrick. So, yeah, I'll look forward to listening in then. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Peter. 
So, well, this all feels just a little bit weird, I've got to say, folks. Um, You know, you hear so many times when people are talking about this sort of thing, or maybe you've seen it, I don't know, maybe it's a podcast. And you know, another podcast or it's a host on a TV show or something like that. And they always go, you look, it's been an honor. And I've always thought, really, that seems a bit odd, but I've got to say, I now get it because I may have started this journey um, just being super excited about the fact that I get to interview all this tech and, you know, satisfy my deep curiosity about these things and find out all of the different tools that are out there and got to the point, in fact, where, you know, they were approaching us so they could be on the show. And, and I really got to deep dive into all sorts of things I otherwise wouldn't have been aware of. But what happened uh, as we progressed through that was you, the listeners, the ensemble community would reach out and would uh, come and see me at events and talk about the things you've done and and the tools that you realize you could use and the exciting adventures you've taken your practices on. And that, that's the part that has been an honor to take you with me on this journey and to get to do that together and to see that it's having an impact on you and what you might then do or implement or change in your practice. Uh, that is just incredible. And so that is a deep honor to be a part of. Um, I am really keen uh, to see where Patrick takes this, you know, given his role in the business he's in, you know, he's deep in this 24 seven, whereas I'm doing it around all sorts of other things. So I think his insights will be invaluable. Be sure to keep him on the hop with other things you'd like him to interview, reach out and engage with him. But I am really looking forward to being on the listener side and getting to listen to episodes going forward. Because to be quite frank, it's a little odd listening to yourself for about an hour and talk about stuff. So I have to admit, I don't deeply listen to the podcast episode. So that's something I'm really looking forward to going forward. Now, I'm not going to be turning up in your earbuds next week, uh, which will be a bit different, um, but I certainly will be in the future. There will be some other podcast mini series we're doing on Ensemble that you'll hear my dulcet tones, and I'm sure that once in a while I'll pop in just to keep you guys all on the hop. But please, no matter where what you do in the future with tech and no matter where you go, just remember, Advice Explorers, it's all about staying curious. 